Let me tell you, a road trip to a remote island off the coast of Maine wasn't exactly my ideal way to spend spring break. But my girlfriend, Alara, had this romantic notion about some cozy seaside town and lobster dinners, and honestly, I'm a sucker for those big, puppy dog eyes of hers. So, there I was, Flynn, city boy extraordinaire, crammed into her tiny hatchback, about to cross the bridge onto a speck of land the locals called Heroic Island. Turns out, the island was exactly as advertised, charming, quaint, the kind of place where everyone smiles and waves even if they've never seen you before. We'd rented this creaky old Victorian B&B on the water's edge. Turns out, we were the only guests. Should have been my first red flag, but Alara was already in full-on vacation bliss, snapping pictures like it was her job. The weirdness started slow. That overly friendly innkeeper, whose grin seemed a bit too wide. The locals, the way they'd give us these sidelong glances, conversations cutting off the minute we approached. Even Alara seemed off. She was always big on nature walks, but here she wouldn't go near the beach, something about the smell of the ocean bothering her. Night two is when things went from quaint but odd to downright horrifying. We were sitting out on that wraparound porch, the moonlight turning the ocean a ghostly silver, when I heard it, a kind of clicking sound, chittering like a thousand crickets overlaid with something else. Wrong. Hey, do you hear that? I asked Alara, a prickle of unease down my spine. She didn't respond, just stared out at the ocean, her face pale. Something's out there, she whispered, the words barely audible. In the water. That's when I saw the ripples. Not the usual waves, but something moving just beneath the surface, a long, sinuous shape that was definitely not any kind of fish I'd ever seen. My blood ran cold. What the hell was that thing? Alara must have been thinking the same thing, because the next morning, she was up before dawn, dragging me to the library. The place looked like it hadn't been updated since the invention of the printing press. In a dusty corner, though, she unearthed an old leather-bound book about local legends. Turns out, those weren't exactly quaint smiles the islanders wore. According to the book, there were stories of a sea creature the old-timers called the Ripper, stories about disappearances, mangled boats washed ashore. It had all the hallmarks of some salty, boogeyman tale, meant to scare kids and gullible tourists like us. But something about it dug its claws into me. Because the more I read, the more it fit, the unsettling stares, the hushed conversations, even Alara's sudden aversion to the sea. Night 3, the Ripper decided to make its grand appearance. I woke to an ungodly scream, Alara, thrashing in bed, eyes wide with terror. The water, she choked out. It tried to take me. Sure enough, her bare feet were wet, seawater glistening on her skin even though the shore was a good fifty yards from our room. The chittering sound was back, louder this time, coming from the open window. I fumbled for something, anything to use as a weapon. Alara was already hauling me towards the door, her usual level-headedness replaced by pure, animalistic fear. We burst out of the B&B, the porch light casting harsh shadows across the lawn. And there it was. The Ripper was nothing like the graceful creature of my nightmares. This thing was a monstrous amalgamation of glistening scales and too many limbs, segmented, clawed legs pulling its slick body out of the waves. The head. God, the head was the worst. It was flattened, all gaping maw and milky, 
white eyes that bulged obscenely. It screeched, an ear-splitting sound that sent shivers down my spine. Alara screamed too, scrambling backwards. I lunged for a loose chunk of flagstone hefted on the flower bed, heaving it at the creature with all my strength. The rock caught it square on its elongated skull. It screeched again, a wet, gurgling sound, and scuttled sideways in a horrifyingly unnatural way. I wasn't sticking around to see if it came back for round two. I grabbed Alara's hand and we ran, not stopping until we were halfway across the rickety bridge back to the mainland. We didn't even look back until we hit the convenience store on the other side. Sitting there under the harsh fluorescence, clutching a gas station coffee like a lifeline, Alara finally managed to choke out the rest of the story. She'd been having dreams, ever since we booked the trip. Dreams of the ocean floor, something calling, beckoning. Turns out, that ripper wasn't just a legend. It was old, older than the island itself, and maybe Alara, well, let's just say, there was something in her bloodline that drew its attention. Heroic Island? Never again. We never even spoke the name aloud on the drive back home, an unspoken agreement. The ocean, though, that once familiar vastness seemed tainted now, a reminder that the depths hold things human eyes aren't meant to see. As for Alara, let's just say her nature walks now stick to well-maintained park trails, far, far away from any crashing waves. The world shifted around us after Heroic. Alara became withdrawn, the nightmares twisting her sunny disposition into something haunted and fragile. I tried to be the steady rock, but the truth gnawed at me, I'd seen that creature, its inhuman eyes and razor-sharp claws. There's a helpless terror that takes root when you realize there are forces in this world that logic can't explain, a cold certainty that settles into your bones. Our relationship, once so easy, became a minefield of unspoken fears. Every time we passed a lake, even a goddamn fountain, I'd see a flash of panic flicker through Alara's eyes. We moved to an apartment in the heart of the city, hoping that concrete and crowds would muffle the pull of the ocean's call. It helped, a bit. We created a new normality filled with takeout nights and noisy neighbors, anything to distract from the shadows that always seemed to lurk at the edge of our awareness. Then came the news report, six months after our escape. A fishing boat capsized off the coast of Maine, another victim of a freak storm. Only this time, there was a survivor a shaken old lobsterman with a story wilder than any tabloid headline. He swore it wasn't. A storm that sank the boat, but something monstrous that exploded from the depths, dragging his crewmates beneath the waves. His description sent a jolt of icy recognition through me. It was the Ripper, bold enough to strike again. The news hit Alara like a physical blow. The nightmares resurged, even worse this time. When I woke to her thrashing screams, it wasn't just the ocean she saw, this time, the creature haunted her sleep, its gaping maw reaching, dripping. The look in her eyes the next morning broke something inside me. We couldn't go on like this. Drastic times called for desperate measures. Through a twisting maze of internet forums and dubious self-proclaimed experts, I found a name, Dr. Alastair Thorne. A marine biologist turned fringe academic, the man had been ostracized for his theories on oceanic anomalies, creatures that defied scientific classification. It was a long shot, but desperation makes you cling to even the flimsiest of hopes. Thorne, surprisingly, was receptive to my frantic email. 
When I mentioned heroic, something shifted in his tone, like an old, buried wound had been reopened. His place was on a remote stretch of the Oregon coast, a ramshackle beach house filled with archaic equipment and enough scientific journals to choke a whale. The man himself had the air of a forgotten prophet, wild eyes, salt and pepper beard in a lifetime of battles fought and lost against scientific orthodoxy. They're drawn to something, Thorn rasped, peering at Alera with unnerving intensity. An energy, a resonance. Like calls to like, in your girl, there's something in her blood, something old. He wouldn't elaborate, just paced the room muttering about ancient lineages and oceanic packs I didn't even want to comprehend. It was the first time I'd seen a flicker of hope return to Alara's eyes, dangerous, reckless hope, but better than the numb resignation she'd been wearing like a shroud. Thorne's plan was both terrifyingly simple and borderline insane, confrontation. We'd head up the coast, find a secluded cove and use Alara as bait, essentially offering her up to the Ripper. His theory was that, if we could just get a closer look at the creature, document its form, he could find some weakness, a way to fight back. It reeked of desperation, of throwing ourselves into the maw of the beast. But what choice did we have? That night on the beach was one drawn straight from a nightmare. Alara stood at the water's edge, bravely trying to quell her trembling. Thorn lurked nearby, ancient-looking camera poised, while I paced like a caged animal, fear and guilt churning in my gut. It felt wrong, letting Alara risk herself. But what was the alternative? Letting that thing haunt her, destroy her, or worse, drag her into the depths. The waiting was the worst part. The ocean hissed and murmured, the moonlight painting deceptive beauty over the water's surface. And then, the chittering began. Soft at first, barely perceptible over the waves, then growing louder, closer. Thorn hissed for us to stay still, his knuckles white where he gripped the camera. It emerged from the shadows with a speed that sent my heart hammering against my ribs. The ripper was even bigger than I remembered, its segmented legs scrambling across the wet sand, home claws tearing up the beach. Moonlight gleamed on its chitinous hide, and I saw something new this time, a series of scars mooring that flat monstrous head. The flagstone hadn't just hurt it, it had marked the creature. It knew us. That's when Alara screamed. The sound wasn't of fear, but of a determination born from desperation, echoing out as a challenge. With a horrifying lunge, the Ripper was upon her. I charged, driven by blind instinct, but Thorn grabbed my arm, his grip surprisingly strong. No, he barked. You'll distract it. We need this. I watched in horror as the Ripper closed in. Alara scrabbled backwards, but the creature was too fast. It snagged her ankle, a vice-like grip that sent her tumbling. She screamed again. But just when it seemed like she'd be dragged under, Alara twisted, reaching, reaching into the depths of her own terror and pulling out some buried, ancestral strength. Her hand closed around a jagged rock, and with a final cry, she smashed it against the Ripper's bulging eye. The scream that ripped from the creature then was unlike anything I could have imagined. It screeched and thrashed, the stench of rotting seaweed filling the air. In the chaos, Thorn snapped picture after picture, the camera's flash blinding in the darkness. And then, almost as quickly as it arrived, it retreated back into the waves, leaving behind a trail of phosphorescent blood that glowed eerily in the moonlight. 
Bellero was a trembling, sobbing mess, but alive. Thorn, in contrast, was almost gleeful, muttering about close-ups of the creature's vulnerable points. He practically danced on the sand, his obsession a stark contrast to the horror of what we just witnessed. It was the moment I realized Thorn was almost as dangerous as the monster we were hunting. The aftermath is a blur. Thorn disappeared into his research, leaving Alara a shattered shell haunted by the night on the beach. I tried to pick up the pieces, but they kept slipping through my fingers. Her nightmares didn't fade, the phantom scent of salt water never truly left her skin. The woman I loved was fading before my eyes, the shared trauma both binding us and driving us apart. In the end, we couldn't outrun our past. She moved back to her hometown, some small Midwestern place with no major bodies of water in sight. We talk, sometimes, but the light in her eyes is gone. Heroic broke us, in different but equally devastating ways. As for me, I still dream of the ocean sometimes, that vast, hungry expanse. But it's not the call of the waves that wakes me in a cold sweat, it's the chilling, inhuman screech of the ripper, forever etched into my memory. I spent last weekend with my friends at a secluded cabin up near Lake Okanaluto in Georgia. Now, we're not talking about a fancy place. This cabin belongs to Brenson's uncle, think more outhouse than in soot bathroom type of deal. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me back up a bit. I've been friends with these guys since I was practically knee high. There's me, Brenson, the sensible one of the bunch, Xander, the outdoorsman, and Harper who couldn't survive a weekend without her makeup kit and phone charger. I know, we're a motley crew. This time, the trip idea came about when Brenson's uncle offered the cabin as a birthday present. You see, Brenson's birthday lands smack in the middle of mosquito season, which is about as appealing as a swarm of angry bees. But a free getaway? Yeah. No amount of bug bites was going to stop us. We packed up Brenson's truck early Friday morning. Me riding shotgun like always, Xander and Harper squeezed in the back. The drive up was the usual mix of terrible singing, off-key harmonizing, and Xander telling one of his long-winded hunting tales. It might sound torturous, but weirdly, I find it kind of comforting. The first sight of the cabin wasn't exactly promising. Peeling paint, a lopsided porch, and that ever-present buzz of hungry mosquitoes, I began to question our collective sanity. But, we'd come this far, so we hauled our backpacks out, determined to at least make the best of it. Now, let me tell you, this place was a throwback. Musty smell, creaky floors and the kind of faded decor that makes you wonder if the 70s ever really left. One thing it did have going for it was the location, the back porch overlooked the lake, and that dense Georgia forest that always has me itching for a campfire and S. Morris. First day. It was mostly about getting settled. Brenson and Xander got to work on chopping firewood, seriously. Those two love swinging an axe, while Harper attempted a makeover on the living room and I attempted to locate something resembling a broom to combat the dust bunnies. You get the idea, domestic bliss it was not. Night fell, and we decided to break out the marshmallows. Turns out, campfire building is one of Xander's many talents, the thing roared to life like something out of a survival show. We settled around it, swapping stories and laughing way too loud for the tranquility of the setting. 
but there's something about being out there, under that giant open sky, that makes you feel like you've shed a layer of city life. Even Harper seemed momentarily content without her phone signal. Around midnight, we turned in. I shared a room with Brenson, a cozy space with two old twin beds. It didn't take long for him to start snoring, the rhythm strangely familiar against the backdrop of crickets chirping outside. But here's where things get weird. I woke up with a jolt. Brenson was still sound asleep, but this strange noise had pierced through my own slumber, like a mix of scratching and rustling. I sat up, straining to place it. It seemed to be coming from the far wall, the same wall as the window that looked out onto the thick woods. Xander, is that you messing around outside? I whispered, but there was no answer. The sound was louder now, persistent. I shook Brenson awake, and even with his groggy eyes, he could hear it too. By now, my heart was hammering against my ribs. That noise, it wasn't an animal. It was too sharp, too deliberate. Brenson got up and slowly padded towards the window, me creeping behind him like a scared kid. The moon hung heavy in the sky, casting just enough light to make out the shapes of the trees bordering the property. And that's when I saw it. Crouched at the edge of the tree line, this hunched form pale and hairless. I gasped, and it snapped its head in our direction. Now listen, I'm no stranger to Georgia wildlife, but this, this was something else. Its eyes, they glowed in the darkness, an unearthly yellow, fixing us in their piercing stare. For a moment, time seemed to freeze. It was just the two of us, and this, creature at the edge of the woods. Brenson muttered something under his breath, and that seemed to break the spell. The thing slowly straightened, towering over the undergrowth. Now, I'm not a tall guy by any stretch, but this creature had at least another foot on me, and it was built all lean and sinewy. Its skin, hairless and tight over its frame, had an almost translucent quality, giving it a ghastly appearance. Suddenly, it charged. Not in a burst of speed, more like a relentless, purposeful stride that ate up the distance between us and the cabin with alarming speed. My brain screamed at me to run, but my feet felt rooted to the spot. The door! Brinson hissed, finally snapping out of his daze. We tore across the room, fumbling with the ancient latch on the back door. We burst outside, the cool night air whipping our faces as we slammed the door shut behind us. We sprinted around to the front of the cabin, where the truck was parked. Xander and Harper, roused by all the commotion, were spilling out onto the porch, their faces a mix of confusion and fear. Get in the truck! Brinson yelled, his voice shaking slightly. We scrambled into the vehicle, breaths ragged in the silence that followed. I could still see it through the dusty windshield, lurking just beyond the reach of the headlights. Its silhouette shifted and twitched, long fingers tipped with claws scraping idly at the ground. Xander was the first to speak, his usually jovial tone replaced by something far more somber. What the hell was that thing? Harper whimpered, clutching at the tattered blanket she'd grabbed on the way out the door. I, I don't know. I've never seen anything like it. Fear hung heavy in the air, the weight of it settling on our shoulders like a suffocating cloak. My mind was a jumbled mess, trying to process what we'd just seen, trying to make sense of the impossible. It was something out of a nightmare, not a weekend getaway with friends. Brenson, ever the pragmatist, fumbled for his phone. 
I'll try calling the police. Naturally, there was zero reception. Out here, we were truly on our own. Maybe we should just wait till morning, I suggested, my voice wavering slightly. My eyes kept darting back to the woods, unable to shake the image of that creature, its inhuman form etched in my memory. The seconds ticked by, each one filled with the sickening tension of anticipation. The creature outside didn't move, but the knowledge of its presence was a relentless torment. My stomach churned, and a bead of sweat traced a line down my temple. We all flinched as a loud crash echoed from the back of the cabin. It sounded like something heavy being thrown against the wall. Xander swore, the hunting rifle he'd brought along suddenly cradled in his arms. That thing's trying to get in, Harper whispered, her voice barely above a whisper. Her eyes were wide pools of terror. Another crash, followed by the splinter of wood. Brinson shook his head. That door won't hold for long. We have to do something. We can't just sit here, Xander agreed, determination hardening his gaze. I say we face it head on. At least then we have a fighting chance. The idea was insane, I knew that. It was basically a suicide mission. But the thought of being trapped, cornered by that thing outside. It was almost a worse fate. Brinson, get the axe. Xander ordered. Harper, you stay here. Try to keep an eye out. Harper protested weakly, but Brenson and I were already heading towards the shed where the tools were kept. My heart pounded in my ears as I wrenched the door open. The rusty axe lay on the workbench, its blade glinting dully in the dim light. Beside it, an old claw hammer. Xander grabbed the hammer, and I took the axe, its weight feeling foreign and unsettling in my hands. He met my eyes, a grim nod passing between us. Ready? I wasn't. Not even close. But I gave a shaky nod anyway because there wasn't any other choice. We crept back to the cabin, pressing ourselves against the remaining solid wall. The creature was nowhere in sight, but we knew it was there, watching, waiting. On three, Xander whispered. One. My pulse was roaring in my head. Two. A wave of nausea washed over me. Three. We burst around the corner, weapons held high. The clearing stood empty. Moonlight bathed the space in an eerie glow, highlighting the splintered remains of the back door. Then, it moved. A blur of pale flesh and elongated limbs, launching itself from the shadowed tree lean. I swung the axe wildly, more out of desperation than strategy. It connected with a sickening thud, sending the creature reeling back. It let out a piercing screech the sound tearing through the night silence. For a fleeting moment, I saw its face up close. It was hairless, its skin stretched taut over a skull too long and narrow. Its eyes, those glowing orbs of yellow, burned with a chilling intensity. But the worst part, was the mouth. An impossibly wide maw, filled with rows of needle-sharp teeth. Xander fired the rifle, the sound deafening in the enclosed space. It stumbled backward, a ragged hole now visible in its shoulder. Still, it didn't go down. It snarled at us, bearing those terrible teeth, a guttural sound rising from its throat. I was certain this was it. This was how we would die, torn apart by this unnatural abomination. Then, a streak of light streaked from the cabin. Harper stood framed in the doorway, a kerosene lantern in her hand. 
Harper, no! I screamed. That thing was going to rip her to shreds. But she wasn't backing down. With a cry, she hurled the lantern. It smashed against the creature with a burst of flames. It screamed, writhing in agony as the fire spread across its pale, hairless flesh. The stench of burning meat filled the air, a nauseating counterpoint to the creature's agonized wails. And then, as quickly as it appeared, it was gone, disappearing back into the woods with uncanny speed. The flames sputtered out, leaving behind a trail of smoke and the faint outline of a charred body. Silence descended, broken only by our ragged gasps. We moved as if in a daze, drawn to the spot where the creature had fallen. It was gone, leaving no trace but the charred patch on the ground to prove it had been real. Shakily, we made our way back to the cabin. We barricaded what remained of the door, huddling together on the sofa until the first light of dawn crept through the broken window. That morning, we packed in silence, the air thick with unspoken questions. As we loaded into Brenson's truck, I couldn't help but take one last look at the woods. It felt like the trees themselves were holding their breath, harboring a terrible secret. We drove away, the image of that creature seared in our minds. The police report filed later was a jumbled mess, attributing the damage to possible bear activity. I remember Brinson shaking his head, the words bear activity seeming absurd given what we witnessed. Nobody believed us, of course. It's been a few weeks since that night, and life has returned to some semblance of normalcy. We go to work, hang out, try to put it all behind us. But it's not that easy. I see that creature every time I close my eyes. It's in human form, those burning eyes. Xander's become withdrawn, jumpy at the slightest sound. Harper barely talks about it at all. Sometimes I wonder if it was all some hallucination, a shared nightmare brought on by campfire stories and the isolation. But then I remember the smell, that sickening burnt meat smell, and I know, deep down, it was horrifically real. The thing in the woods is still out there, and the chilling truth is, we may never truly be safe. I never pegged myself for a weekend getaway kinda guy, but hey, sometimes you gotta follow your friends into questionable decisions. This time it was a cabin trip. My buddy, Cade, nature lover, beard enthusiast, swore up and down that a few days roughing it would be good for my city softened soul. I guess the dude wasn't technically wrong, though my idea of roughing it involves a hotel where the Wi-Fi works. Anywho, this cabin belonged to Cade's family and was planted deep in the backwoods of Oregon. And when I say backwoods, I mean hours driving down barely paved roads, surrounded by more trees than a person could reasonably count. Turns out, cell service ain't too fond of those regions either. But hey, at least the cabin was actually more than four walls and a dirt floor. Think faded wood paneling, musty couches, and a fireplace that probably hadn't been cleaned since the Reagan era. The first day was mostly settling in. Kate was in heaven, yapping about identifying birds and whatnot while I tried figuring out a way to rig up a TV out of twigs and acorns. Night rolled around, and we decided to break out the marshmallows and make a backyard bonfire. Seemed harmless enough. It's funny, the things you remember when the world goes sideways. The way the flames flickered, throwing crazy shadows on the trees. The smell of burnt sugar and wood smoke. The silence, deep and thick like a blanket, 
only broken by crickets and the occasional rustle of leaves. That's when I saw it. Just inside the tree line, this thing. First, I thought it was a deer, big and pale in the wavering firelight. But then it stood on its hind legs, and let me tell you, no deer looks like that. This thing was tall, impossibly tall. It was thin too, limbs like stretched out branches, and its skin, if you could even call it skin, was this translucent gray that shone sickly in the moonlight. The head. Lord, I can still see it. Like a human skull, stretched out and twisted, with these enormous black pits where eyes should be. I couldn't even scream, just kind of choked as this creature stared right at us. Cade noticed next. He went white as a sheet, all his nature boy chill gone in a blink. The thing tilted his head, slow and deliberate, like it was sizing us up. We both jolted when a twig snapped from the forest, and with a speed that defied its lanky form, it vanished as if it were never there. Great in, what the actual hell was that? Cade's voice shook, a shaky contrast to his usual booming baritone. That name's Great in, by the way. Not that it matters when there's a, a monster lurking in your vacation spot. My response? I wish I had a cool one-liner, but nope, all I managed was a strangled, I don't freaking know. Panic set in then. Cade, bless his granola-loving heart, started yelling about needing to barricade the place, while I kept staring out towards those trees, half expecting the creature to emerge. It didn't, but the sense of being watched, hunted even, never quite left. We ended up huddled on the ratty living room floor with axes, yeah, axes, we found in the musty shed. The rest of the night was mostly adrenaline and whispered, panicked arguments about what to do. Should we try to break for it at sunrise? Hide and hope it somehow forgot about us. Honestly, both plans sounded pretty suicidal. Morning came, and as much as I hate admitting it, the sunshine and chirping birds brought a tiny shred of hope. Maybe it was all a messed up dream, some kind of weird forest mirage. Gathering our stuff, we crept towards Cade's ancient truck. That's when the screaming started. It tore through the woods, high-pitched, full of terror, and abruptly cut off. Cade and I exchanged a look, the color draining from our faces. Whatever that was, it wasn't alone. The truck go. I yelled, already sprinting. We stumbled in, hands fumbling with keys and sweaty palms slipping on the steering wheel. With the roar of the engine, Cade hit the gas. We bounced along that dirt path, branches whipping at the windows, all I could focus on was the rearview mirror, the growing certainty that those woods held something worse than any nightmare. Just as it felt like we might actually escape, we heard it. A slam against the truck bed and then a scrabbling, clawing sound, it was on the roof. Cade was swerving the truck like a madman, trying to shake it off, but with every jerk and jolt, the scratching got closer. Then, the window shattered. Glass sprayed everywhere. I saw it then. A long, skeletal arm, tipped with claws reaching in through the broken glass. It slashed wildly, cutting Cade's shoulder. He yelped, momentarily losing control. The truck veered off the path, crashing sideways into a stand of trees. The impact sent me flying, everything twisting into a whirlwind of pain and noise. My head smacked against the dashboard, and for a blissful moment, everything went black. When I came to, it was to the world upside down. Cade was hanging limp from his seatbelt, 
blood splattered across his flannel shirt. Groaning, I tried to move, but a wave of nausea washed over me. Every inch of me felt like it had been through a meat grinder. Outside, the scratching had resumed, that incessant clawing at the twisted metal. My foggy brain finally caught up, that thing was still out there, and we were sitting ducks. Adrenaline kicked in, masking some of the pain. Reaching for the door handle proved an agonizing feat, like my arm was full of broken glass. Stumbling out into the sunlight, my legs barely held me. That creature wasted no time. Slithering out of the wreckage, it was even more horrifying up close. Its movements were jerky, unnatural, like its bones were barely held together. Its face, if you could call it that, was locked in this grotesque rictus, revealing rows of needle-like teeth. I fumbled for something, anything to use as a weapon, finding only a broken tree branch. Lame, I know, but it was all I had. The creature stalked towards me, its head swiveling slightly, those empty black eyes boring into mine. Then, from behind, came a scream. A female scream. My blood ran cold. Another one? Or, help, over here. The voice was coming from further in the woods. Hope, desperate and irrational, sparked in my chest. There was someone else out there, someone who might actually have a real weapon. Cade. I yelled, the word catching in my throat. Stay there. I didn't wait for a response. Survival instincts override buddy-saving instincts when there's a, whatever that thing was, on the loose. I ran, blindly, branches whipping my face. I followed the shouts, dodging trees, and tripping over roots. Finally, I burst into a clearing and froze. A woman, maybe in her late twenties, with fiery red hair, was facing something straight out of a Lovecraft novel. It looked similar to the one we'd encountered, but bigger, taller, with what could only be described as tentacles writhing along its back. This one held something in its claws, a bundle of tattered clothes that was horrifyingly familiar. Kate's flannel shirt. No words were needed. Everything clicked into awful place. Cade was gone. This thing, it wasn't just hunting, it was, collecting. My mind rebelled against the thought. Fueled by anger and grief, I roared and charged, swinging that flimsy branch with everything I had. It probably did nothing more than annoy the creature, but it got its attention. It whipped around, those tentacles lashing out like snakes. One clipped my leg, sending me sprawling to the ground. The woman was suddenly beside me, hauling me up with surprising strength. This way, she yelled, already running. I scrambled behind her, the adrenaline numbing the pain in my battered body. We sprinted deeper into the woods, the sound of the creature crashing through the underbrush growing closer, its screeches echoing through the trees. We ran until we couldn't run anymore, collapsing against a moss-covered rock. Gasping for breath, I turned to the woman. She met my eyes, exhaustion etched on her dirt-streaked face. I'm Sasha, she rasped, extending a hand. I saw the crash. Graydon, I replied, my voice barely above a whisper. What the hell is going on? Sasha shook her head, those fiery curls framing a face etched with terror. I've been tracking those things for weeks. We thought there was only one. Her voice trailed off, replaced by the snapping of branches as the creature closed in. Desperation clawed at me. 
It wasn't just one, they were out there, who knows how many. But how had Sasha stayed alive this long? I needed answers, but survival was the priority right then. Through the trees, I could see it, approaching slowly, almost savoring our fear. Those tentacles thrashed in anticipation. I felt utterly helpless, reduced to a trembling, soon-to-be victim. Sasha, though, seemed different. It wasn't the look of complete despair I expected. Instead, her eyes narrowed with determination, a grim kind of resolve. She reached into her backpack, pulling out something that made me choke back a disbelieving laugh. A flamethrower. Apparently, Sasha wasn't going down without a fight. The creature emerged from the trees. I half expected Sasha to ignite the damn thing right then and there, but she held back. It continued its slow advance, drawing closer and closer. Maybe it was toying with us, enjoying the terror it instilled. Every instinct demanded I flee, but Sasha stood her ground. Finally, when it was mere yards away, she raised the flamethrower. A burst of fire roared to life, illuminating the forest. The thing shrieked, recoiling from the flames. It flailed wildly, smoke curling off its translucent flesh. But it didn't retreat, simply circled, its black eyes fixed on us with chilling intelligence. Sasha blasted it again, and again. The stench of burning flesh became overpowering. Still, the creature persisted, driven by either hunger or some twisted sense of sport. But we got a good look at it now, its skin was blistering, charring in some places, yet there was no blood, nothing resembling a wound. It's not working. I yelled over the roar of the flames. We're going to run out of fuel. Sasha didn't reply, just emptied the last bit on the creature in one final blast. It screeched, a spine-chilling sound, and vanished back into the forest. Silence descended, broken only by the crackle of dying flames and our ragged breaths. The aftermath was a numb blur. Sasha, bless her pyromaniac soul, had a hideout nearby and somehow I managed to stumble after her. We patched each other up as best we could, the whole time neither of us daring to speak of what had happened, of what was still out there. A few days later, we managed to flag down a passing trucker who took us to the nearest town. The story we gave the cops was one of wild bears and a tragic hiking accident. They gave us those pitying looks people give to those clearly traumatized. I don't live in the city anymore. Got myself a cabin in the woods, funny enough. I know those things are still out there, and part of me, a twisted, vengeful part, almost wants them to find me. Sasha's gone off the grid, hunting them, she says. Can't say I blame her. Sometimes, late at night, I think I hear them in the trees, those empty, scratching sounds, and the chilling, inhuman screams. I guess the question is, do I wait for them to come to me, or do I find them first? Okay, I get that heading out to your buddy's secluded lake house for a weekend of fishing and beer sounds pretty wholesome. Trust me, I thought the same thing. I'm Wes, by the way, city guy turned reluctant outdoorsman, at least according to my friend, Killian. Killian's family owns this little cabin on some lake way up in northern Wisconsin. I hadn't been out there since we were kids, mostly because the words remote and mosquito infested are never my idea of a good time. But this trip felt different. Maybe it was the stress of city life wearing me thin, 
or the fact that Killian wouldn't stop raving about the epic fishing. Either way, when he pitched the weekend, I found myself saying a begrudging yes. The actual drive out wasn't all that bad. Sure, the last few miles were bumpy dirt roads that made my teeth rattle, but the scenery was admittedly pretty. Dense forest, that classic pine fresh smell, for a short while, I almost felt, okay. The cabin was about what you'd expect, rustic, a bit musty, with the decor frozen somewhere in the 1970s. Didn't exactly scream relaxing getaway, but hey, it had beds and a fridge for beer, so I wasn't complaining. The first night was mainly unpacking and catching up. Killian brought out an impressive collection of fishing gear, and I mostly contributed to the good vibes with city gossip and the case of beer I'd lugged out. As the fire crackled and darkness settled over the lake, we fell into easy conversation, that old friendship warming me more than the whiskey. Turns out, Killian's been a regular at this spot, coming out most weekends. I listened, slightly envious of the peace that seemed to settle over him when he talked about the lake, the woods. Eventually, we drifted off to sleep, and for once, the city hum in my brain faded. Morning came, bright and annoyingly cheerful. Killian, the outdoorsy weirdo, was already up and making coffee. Turns out, we were headed out onto the lake, prime time for fishing, apparently. With a groan and exaggerated grumbling, I dragged myself into decent clothes and stumbled into the old-timey rowboat. We'd rented a tiny motor, its sputtery sound breaking the stillness as we chugged out to Killian's favorite spot. Now, let me say, I appreciate a good sunrise. But fishing? Eh, not so much. Still, Killian was in his element, a goofy grin on his usually stoic face. I sat back, can of beer sweating in my hand, and begrudgingly admired the view. The lake was like glass, reflecting the morning light in a way that was almost distractingly beautiful. There's a serenity that comes with being surrounded by nothing but nature, I'll give it that. Then came the ripple. It started small, barely noticeable against the smooth surface. Big fish, Killian muttered, that predator gleam in his eye. But this wasn't a fish. Slowly, a shape began to emerge from the depths of the lake. It was long, sinuous breaking the waterline in a series of smooth humps. I felt a chill run down my spine. What the hell is that? My whisper felt loud in the sudden stillness. Killian's gaze was fixated on the shape. I... I don't know, he finally responded, his voice tight. The creature, because that's what it was, glided lazily towards the boat. I could make out scales now, iridescent green and blue shimmering in the sunlight, utterly alien. The head, if you could call it that, was flat, broad, with a wide, lipless mouth that curved in a grotesque parody of a smile. It had no eyes that I could see, just two small indentations where eyes might once have been. Terror clamped my throat shut. We watched, petrified. As this aquatic nightmare circled our tiny boat, its smooth movements creating ripples that sent shivers through the thin hull. My heart hammered against my ribs, my mouth dry as parchment. Suddenly, the creature lashed out. It slammed against the side of the boat, knocking Killian right off his perch. He let out a startled yell as he hit the icy water disappearing beneath the surface. I scrambled to reach him, ignoring the rocking boat, but he surfaced on his own, gasping for air. He managed to haul himself back in, soaked and shivering, eyes wide with a terror that mirrored my own. 
The creature was gone, vanished back into the depths as silently as it had appeared. We didn't speak, just grabbed the oars and rowed for shore with desperate strokes. My mind raced, stuck in a loop between what we saw and the very real fact that Killian almost ended up lake monster food. Back at the cabin, we just sat there, shaking. Eventually, we forced down shots of whiskey, the burn a welcome distraction. Killian was the first to break the silence. We can't tell anyone, he said, voice ragged. They'll think we're crazy. I nodded miserably. He was right. Who the hell would believe a story about some Lovecraft-inspired lake serpent? The rest of the day was numb. We packed in forced silence, Killian's usual enthusiasm for the woods conspicuously absent. The drive back was a tense blur, the only sound in the car the rattle of my increasingly unsteady nerves. The city seemed jarringly loud after the quiet of the woods. My apartment felt cramped, stifling. That night, nightmares plagued my sleep, images of that toothy grin, the glint of those alien scales beneath the water. Every creak of my apartment floor sounded like the rustle of those inhuman coils sliding through the depths. Killian called once, twice. I couldn't bring myself to answer. The days blurred together. I went through the motions, work, eat, sleep, repeat. Sleep was the worst, my traitorous mind conjuring that lake, that creature, over and over again. I found myself checking the news constantly, half expecting reports of missing fishermen, unexplained accidents, anything to validate what we'd seen. Nothing. Weeks passed. I started losing track of days. Killian hadn't called again. Logically, I knew a weekend encounter, no matter how horrifying, shouldn't derail my entire life. But logic doesn't do much when your sanity is fraying at the edges. A desperate kind of. Restlessness took hold. I needed answers, or hell, at least someone else to confirm I wasn't completely losing my mind. On a sleepless Friday night, an idea struck me, the kind of idea that feels simultaneously brilliant and completely unhinged. The Internet. Surely, I couldn't be the only one to see something unexplainable out in the boonies. I spent hours scouring forums digging through old news reports, desperately looking for something, anything that resembled my experience. And I found it. A message board dedicated to cryptids and odd sightings. One thread, posted three years ago, made the blood freeze in my veins. Title, The Watcher in the Lake. The author described a fishing trip to a remote Wisconsin lake, an encounter with a long, snake-like creature with eerily similar features to what Killian and I had witnessed. There were a few skeptical responses, a couple of excited me to s. I felt a twisted surge of relief, I wasn't alone. I sent the thread's creator a message, my fingers trembling over the keyboard. The reply came the next day. The guy's name was Devin. Turns out, he lived in a town just a couple of hours from Killian's lake house. He'd been obsessed with finding that damn thing ever since his encounter, driving out to the lake almost every weekend, staking it out. We traded stories, comparing details. Every match, every chilling confirmation, was both horrifying and a grim sort of comfort. There was one point, however, where our stories diverged. Devin claimed to have seen it again, multiple times. He swore it was hunting something, fixated on a particular spot near the shore. Something was luring it back. 
I had a sinking feeling I knew what that something was. The decision to go back was reckless, insane even. But there was a kind of madness taking root in me, a mix of fear and a desperate, almost vengeful, curiosity. Next Saturday morning, armed with shaky bravado and a duffel bag full of questionable supplies, I was in my car, headed back to that cursed lake. Reaching the cabin felt surreal, like stepping into a twisted alternate dimension. Everything was the same, the musty scent, the outdated furniture, the serene view of the lake. With trembling hands, I unpacked a small inflatable raft, a pair of cheap binoculars, and a hunting knife I'd found in the back of a dusty kitchen drawer. This wasn't about fishing anymore, it was war. The plan was simple and stupid, find a vantage point, watch, wait. Settle the churning questions, even if the answers were monstrous. I found my spot, a rocky outcropping with a decent view of the stretch of water Devon had described. With a heart beating painfully loud in my ears, I settled in. Hours passed. Nothing but the lapping of water and the rustling of leaves in the breeze. Doubt gnawed at me. Was I chasing a ghost, a figment of a shared trauma-induced hallucination? Dusk began to settle, painting the lake in ominous hues. It was time to pack up, admit defeat. Just then, I saw it. That familiar ripple broke the surface, sending chills down my spine. My breath hitched. The creature surfaced. It was headed straight for the spot Devin mentioned, moving with a chilling purposefulness. Its smooth, serpentine body cut through the water with unnatural speed. It was bigger this time, the scales seeming even more pronounced in the dim light. A horrifying realization dawned on me. Killian had almost been its prey. My friend, my fishing buddy, almost dragged into the depths by this lake demon. A surge of rage fueled me, chasing away the paralyzing fear. Grabbing the binoculars, I scanned the waterline frantically. And there, just a mere hundred yards from where the creature lingered, was Killian's rowboat, still tied to a half-rotted dock. His boat. My mind raced, had Killian come back too? Was he out there right now, unwittingly tethered to a lurking leviathan? The thought sent a surge of adrenaline through my sluggish veins. Forget waiting. Forget stealth. I scrambled down the outcropping, fumbled with the raft, and paddled out onto the lake, heart pounding a frantic tattoo against my ribs. The light was fading fast, and shapes were starting to melt into shadows. It was getting harder to see. Then I spotted it again, mere feet from the boat. Its flat head was raised above the water, as if sensing something. In the fading light, the shape of Killian's boat was barely visible a dark speck against the expanse of the lake. Panic propelled me into a frenzy of paddling. I never even considered how this would end, what I'd do once I reached them. Blind instinct drove me on. But it seems my reckless charge was not entirely unnoticed. The creature turned its head, and even in the twilight, I could sense those empty pits fixating on me. Then, with a speed that sent a wave of icy despair crashing over me, it moved. The force of the impact flipped the raft, sending me tumbling into the frigid depths. Even as I struggled back to the surface, gasping, the creature was already on the move again. I watched in horror as it rammed against the side of Killian's boat, wood splintering under the onslaught. The aftermath is a whirl of screams, both mine and I suspect, Killian's, splashes, and the relentless thrashing of that enormous, serpentine body. 
Then, suddenly, blessedly, it was gone, disappearing beneath the waves as quickly as it had appeared. Let me tell you, a road trip through rural Mississippi to stay at your estranged grandpa's old hunting cabin wasn't my idea of a five-star getaway. But my buddy, Silas, wouldn't take no for an answer. See, Gramps had passed a few weeks back, and Silas, his ever-responsible grandson, was hell-bent on getting the place cleaned out so it could be sold. Me? I'm Elian. By the way, city boy by birth with a severe allergy to anything resembling manual labor. But loyalty is a hell of a drug, and before you know it, we're packed into Silas' ancient 4x4, heading deep into the heart of mosquito country. The drive was as miserable as predicted, sticky heat, back roads bumpier than a rodeo bull, all punctuated by Silas' relentless optimism about the adventure awaiting us. The cabin, when we finally found it, wasn't any prettier. Decades of neglect had turned the once charming wood exterior into a patchwork of peeling paint and dubious-looking moss. Great, just great. Inside was a dusty time capsule of country clichés, plaid furniture, deer antlers on the wall, a kitchen that hadn't been updated since the Carter administration. I stifled a sneeze. Silas, ever the Energizer Bunny, was already rummaging through closets and declaring it wouldn't take long to whip the place into shape. Yeah, right. Night fell early out there in the sticks. No street lights, no hum of traffic, just the eerie symphony of crickets and the rustle of wind through the trees. Silas lit a fire in that ancient stone hearth, the flickering light doing little to chase away the unsettling vibe. Then, like some cheesy horror flick, the power went out. Plunged into darkness, I fumbled for my phone's flashlight. Generators out back, Silas grumbled. I'll go fire it up. He slipped on his boots and stepped out into the night, leaving me in the claustrophobic, flickering gloom. That's when I heard it. A splash, out beyond the porch. I tried to convince myself it was just an animal, but there was something off about the sound, too heavy for a fish, too rhythmic for a random critter. Fear nibbled at the edge of my thoughts. Silas had been gone longer than it should take. My skin prickled, and not because of the missing AC. Grabbing a rusty poker from the fireplace for good measure, I cautiously opened the cabin door. Moonlight cast long, warped shadows across the porch. Silas? My voice cracked embarrassingly in the stillness. Silence was the only answer. That's when I saw the blood. Spatters of it, dark against the weathered wooden boards. My stomach lurched. I followed the gruesome trail, flashlight beam trembling. It led toward the back of the cabin, ending in a thick smear that disappeared over the edge of an old well. Oh God. My mind raced conjuring horrifying images of Silas tumbling down that moss-slick shaft. Silas. I yelled again, my voice desperate. Then came the sound of wet, labored breathing. I swung the flashlight beam towards the source, barely stifling a scream. Silas was halfway out of the well, hauling himself up with a strength I didn't know he possessed and he wasn't alone. Clinging to him was a shape out of nightmares. Its skin was translucent, slick and slimy like a salamander's but stretched over a freakishly elongated humanoid frame. The head, dear lord, the head was flat, eyeless, with a wide slit of a mouth that curled in a predatory grin. This thing wasn't just hauling itself out of the well, it was attached to Silas, 
its arm-like limbs wrapped around his torso with horrifying strength. Panic exploded through me, Silas was in trouble, big trouble. But instead of yelling something sensible, something helpful, what came out of my mouth was a strangled squeak. It didn't seem to matter. The creature twisted its sinuous form toward the sound, raising a clawed hand. That's when Silas finally made it over the lip of the well, tumbling onto the ground. Seizing the moment, I lunged forward and began bashing that thing with the poker. It hissed, a sound like steam escaping a pipe, and recoiled, its claws slashing at my retreating form. Silas scrambled backwards, eyes wild, a strangled shout tearing from his throat. I swung the poker again, and again, driving the creature back. For a heart-stopping moment, it seemed to hesitate. Then, with a last hateful hiss, it slunk back over the edge of the well, vanishing into the murky depths. Shaking and drenched in sweat, I knelt beside Silas. He stared up at me, his face a mask of shock. What the hell, was that? His voice was barely a whisper. I don't know, I choked out, my own voice trembling. We scrambled inside, slamming the door shut, fumbling with ancient locks and shoving a dresser against it for good measure. Exhaustion washed over me. Silas didn't even protest when I suggested leaving the rest of the clean-out for tomorrow. In the bleak light of dawn, we packed up and hightailed it back to civilization. The drive home was silent. When we did speak, it was about the generator, the busted water heater, the endless list of repairs that would make the cabin more appealing to buyers. We haven't been back since. The memory of that night lurks at the edge of my thoughts, the inhuman grin, the hiss of its voice, the impossible strength in its slimy grip. Silas sells insurance now, I hear. Me? I'll stick to apartment living, thanks. You won't catch me anywhere near a well, ever again. We tried to move on. We tried to pretend that night in Mississippi had just been a bad dream, two city boys losing their minds in the boonies. But the problem with monsters is that they don't disappear just because you choose to ignore them. Turns out, when you have a close encounter with a translucent, well-dwelling abomination, it leaves a mark. The weeks after our escape turned into a living nightmare. Night terrors plagued my sleep, filled with visions of that gaping maw and those soulless, black pits where eyes should have been. I'd wake up in a cold sweat, convinced something was lurking in the shadows of my bedroom. Silas didn't fare much better. He became withdrawn, jumpy, the perpetual smile that used to be plastered to his face replaced with a haunted frown. We couldn't even bring ourselves to talk about it. Every conversation felt loaded, the unspoken question of what we'd seen hanging in the air. And, in the back of both our minds, a chilling question was simmering, was it truly over? Had the creature retreated back to its well, or was it something that could follow us back into our normal lives? The first sign that our fears were justified came with the news report. A fisherman had gone missing near a lake just two counties north of where Gramps' cabin stood. His boat was found overturned, his body never recovered. The news painted it as a tragic accident, but Silas and I exchanged a grim look. We knew better. Fear shifted to a bitter resolve settling down in my gut. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't going to disappear on its own. We had to do something, even if we sounded like lunatics to the rest of the world. Silas, bless him, seemed to be on the same page. Research became our obsession. 
We spent nights poring over the internet, digging into obscure local folklore and reports of unexplained disappearances. The more we found, the more nauseating the picture became. Similar stories stretched back decades, not just in Mississippi, but other states, other countries. Always near water, always a missing body, and always a lingering sense of something unnatural just beneath the surface. Finally, we found something concrete. An old manuscript, digitized on a dark corner of the web, described a creature akin to an aquatic demon, drawn to isolated places, luring its victims into the depths. It matched eerily well with what we'd seen. Silas, ever the practical one, immediately started collecting supplies. Silver-based weaponry, Lore seemed to agree the creature had an aversion to the stuff, diving equipment, waterproof flashlights, you name it, he found it with an intensity that bordered on obsession. Then came the hardest part, the return. We packed up his truck once more, this time with less hesitation and a whole lot more firepower. The drive back to that godforsaken cabin was tense, filled with a grim determination that barely masked the gnawing terror in our stomachs. As we neared that familiar patch of woods, a new fear reared its ugly head. What if it was gone? What if we'd geared up in vain, if all our frantic preparations had been for nothing? We approached the well cautiously. I gripped a silver-tipped harpoon, its weight barely reassuring in my trembling hands. Silas hefted a hunting rifle, his gaze laser-focused on the murky waters. Peering over the edge, my heart sank. Nothing. Not even a ripple disturbed the inky blackness. Hours passed as we kept vigil. Doubt gnawed at me. Maybe it had moved on, maybe we were chasing shadows after all. That's when I saw it. A subtle shift in the water, a barely perceptible swirl deep below the surface. Then, the creature emerged. Slow, sinuous, it rose from the depths until that grotesque, eyeless head broke the surface. It seemed to recognize us. With a gurgle that sent goosebumps down my spine, it lifted a clawed hand, pointing straight at us. Hatred burned in the empty sockets where its eyes should have been. We opened fire. The sound of the rifle cracked through the still air as silver bullets ripped through the water. It thrashed wildly, screeching in inhuman rage as the bullets tore into its slimy flesh. The thrashing intensified, and suddenly, it lurched upwards. I barely had time to register its horrifying speed before it was upon us, its clawed hand tearing through the moss-covered stone of the well. Silas screamed as he was dragged toward the opening, the creature's impossible strength overpowering his frantic struggles. In a split second of clarity, I lunged forward. The butt of the rifle connected with the creature's flat skull, and for one blessed moment, its grip slackened. With a surge of strength I didn't know I possessed, I pulled Silas back from the edge. It screeched in fury, but its moment had passed. Wounded, it started sinking again, its hateful gaze burning into ours even as it disappeared back into the darkness. Shaking, soaked in stinking well water, Silas and I clung to each other. We'd won the battle, at least for now. But the aftermath was a bleak wasteland. The creature still lurked out there. It knew us now. The thing we feared most had a face to go with the terror. Silas and I never went back to that cabin. The place was sold, the proceeds barely enough to cover the cost of therapy. I moved to an apartment in the middle of the city, high floor, with a view that stretches for miles. 
No chance of any hidden wells here. Silas. Well, I heard he moved out west somewhere, a desert state. As far from water as you can get. We don't talk about what happened much anymore. But sometimes, late at night, I still hear the water dripping, a persistent tap 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 that echoes just a little too much like the sound of claws against stone. Maybe we vanquished our monster that day, maybe we just delayed the inevitable. All I know for sure is that I can never look at a quiet stretch of water the same way again. There are some things humans weren't meant to see, some depths better left undisturbed. We found that out the hard way. Let's face it, my buddy Kale's always been the impulsive type. When he called out of the blue, raving about a sweet summer gig restoring old cabins in rural Oregon, I should have hung up right then. But hey, I'm Elian, and sometimes even a history major needs a break from dusty books right? Turns out, rural Oregon meant deeper in the woods than I'd ever been. The moment we rolled up to the ranger station that served as our makeshift base camp, I knew this wasn't gonna be some national park glamping trip. The ranger, old grizzled Gus, eyed us like we were tenderfoot campers about to get ourselves eaten alive. Kale, bless his optimistic heart, was unfazed. Don't mind Gus, he grinned. Dude just loves spooking the city folk. Two days later, knee-deep in fixing up a mossy old cabin straight out of some Grimm's fairy tale that didn't seem so funny anymore. There was an oddness in the air, a stillness that felt heavy. Even the birdsong had gone quiet. Think we're being watched. I joked trying to shake off a creeping unease. Kale, usually king of dumb chatter, just shrugged. His silence was more worrying than any ghost story. That night, I woke to the sound of scratching outside the cabin. Half asleep, I figured it was a critter, maybe a raccoon. But then came a thump against the wall that made the whole structure shake. This wasn't no raccoon. Heart thudding, I poked Kale awake. Dude, did you hear that? I hissed. He sat bolt upright, eyes wide. Yeah, something's out there. Now, we're not exactly wilderness rookies. But the sound that followed. God, I hope I never hear it again. It was like metal scraping stone, a long, screeching rasp. Then silence, followed by a low, guttural growl that seemed to rumble up from the ground itself. Kale was already up, grabbing the flashlight and the old rifle Gus had loaned us. His hands were shaking, but he was forcing himself into action mode. Smart guy, my impulsive buddy. I took a shaky breath, trying to match his resolve. There it was again, the screech, closer this time. The flashlight beam cut through the woods, revealing nothing. Just gnarled old trees and thick undergrowth. For a moment, I thought we were imagining things. Then, the smell hit. It was like nothing I'd ever encountered musky and rank with a hint of rot, like opening an ancient tomb. Let's get back inside, Kale whispered, voice tight. No argument from me. We barricaded the door with everything we could find. The rest of the night was just waiting. Every creak, every rustle of leaves outside had us jumping, rifle at the ready. Gus had warned us about cougars, but this felt different. Predatory, yes, but with a chilling intelligence behind the growls. Dawn brought a blessed respite, but the feeling of dread lingered. We radioed Gus. Static, nothing but static. 
our only link to civilization, gone. I tried to convince myself it was equipment failure, but a sinking feeling told me different. We can't stay here, Kale finally said, his voice grim. Whatever that thing is, it's playing with us. Packing was a blur. Every part of me screamed to run, not look back. Just as we were about to bolt, I saw it. A flash of movement between the trees, too big to be any animal I recognized. And in that split second, I glimpsed something even more terrifying, a hunched shape, twisted and elongated, with a muzzle stretched into something, wrong. It was gone as quickly as it appeared, leaving me reeling. Did you, did you see that? I stammered. Kale's face was pale as he nodded. Not natural, he said. Something else. We ran. Ran till our lungs burned, stopping only when we stumbled onto a logging road at dusk. I collapsed, gasping for breath. Next to me, Kale wasn't looking much better. This ain't some stupid animal, he panted. We gotta get help. His voice trailed off. I followed his gaze, my blood turning to slush. In the fading light, on the crest of a hill just above us, it stood. The creature. Its silhouette was monstrous against the dimming sky, and this time I got a good look at its eyes. They glowed, not red like in the movies, but a dull, milky white that reflected the failing light blind, but unmistakably focused on us. As if sensing our gaze, the creature tilted its head. Its elongated jaws opened in what could only be a grotesque parody of a grin, revealing rows of jagged teeth. A chittering, rasping sound echoed across the clearing. It was laughter. Cruel, knowing laughter. The sight of that grin shattered any illusions of escape. We were cornered, the hunter relishing the game. Kale, bless him, didn't freeze. Always the one with the crazy ideas, he started yelling. Not terrified screams, but taunts, insults flung at our grotesque tormentor. Come on, you freak, he bellowed, waving his arms. What cho waiting for, ugly? I was cringing inside, but the weird thing was, it worked. The creature twitched in what seemed like annoyance. Its unsettling, chittering laughter cut off abruptly, replaced by a deep, rumbling snarl. With a sickening lurch, it charged. The thing's speed was inhuman. One moment it was on the hill, the next a blur of darkness streaking towards us. We scattered like rabbits. Kale fired the rifle more out of desperation than strategy, the shots tearing into the trees. It dodged, its movements impossible, like it was teleporting short distances. I stumbled, fell. My ankle flared in white-hot pain. No way I could run, I was done for. A scream tore from my throat. Not for myself, but for Kale. He was still on his feet, trying to draw the thing away from me. He was going to get himself killed. Kale! Run, I managed to choke out. He didn't even look back. Just kept running, taunting leading it into the thickening woods. Tears streamed down my face, mixing with dirt and sweat. This was all my fault. I shouldn't have come, shouldn't have let my stupid curiosity drag us into this mess. Then, a sound that caught through my despair, the unmistakable roar of an engine. A truck, headlights piercing the gloom, barreled down the logging road. The creature hesitated, its milky eyes shifting from me to the truck, then back to where Kale had disappeared.
Hope surged, reckless and desperate. Over here! I yelled, waving my arms frantically. The truck screeched to a halt. Two burly loggers jumped out, axes in their hands. I babbled out a half-crazed explanation in gasps, pointing into the woods. They exchanged a skeptical look, but there was a weary glint in their eyes. These were woodsmen, they knew not everything out here made sense. Where's your friend? One of them barked. My words caught in my throat. He, he, distracted it. Their faces hardened. Then, without hesitation, they plunged into the darkness, axes at the ready. I was left alone, the sounds of their movement and my own ragged breathing filling the night. Minutes felt like hours. The creature's screeches, the occasional gunshot, then, horrifying silence. I couldn't take it anymore. Ignoring my throbbing ankle, I limped, crawled, dragged myself towards the sound. The scene that met me was something out of a nightmare. Moonlight filtered through the trees, casting long, grotesque shadows. The clearing was torn up, branches snapped, the earth churned. Amidst the chaos, Kale lay crumpled against a fallen tree. One of the loggers was knelt beside him. Is he? I couldn't even finish the question. The logger shook his head, his face grim. He ain't gonna make it. That critter. He trailed off, cursing under his breath. I crawled over a kale, my vision blurring with tears. He was barely recognizable, his clothes shredded, his body a canvas of gashes. But he opened his eyes, a flicker of my old friend still there. Did, did we get it? He rasped. His voice was a fading whisper. One of the loggers stepped forward. It got away, son. Clean away. Never seen nothing like it. Kale closed his eyes. A smile, faint and bittersweet, touched his battered lips. Then, we won, ha? Huh? Bought you some time. In that moment, Kale, my impulsive, big-hearted buddy, was braver than I could ever hope to be. His last breath rattled out, and then he was still. The brave, cocky grin was frozen on his face like a final mockery of the horror that had taken him. Help arrived at dawn, park rangers, summoned by the surviving logger. There were questions, official reports, hushed whispers about wild animal attacks and freak accidents. I sat through it all, numb, mechanically answering their questions, my eyes fixed on Kale's body strapped to a stretcher. Nobody believed the truth, of course. Too fantastical, too damn weird. But they didn't have to. I knew. In every single night of my life since, I've seen those milky eyes in the darkness just before sleep, heard that raspy, chittering laugh echoing on the wind. The aftermath is me living, but not really. I went back to college, finished my degree like a robot. Got a job, an apartment, all the trappings of a normal life. But nights, nights are hell. City lights, locked doors, none of it keeps the fear at bay. I see that shape in every shadow, smell that rotting musk in the breeze after a rain. Some part of me wants revenge. Wants to hunt down whatever it is, make it pay. But mostly, I'm just terrified. Terrified of what else is lurking out there in the dark, and terrified that it already knows where to find me. Sometimes, I think Kale got the better deal. At least he went down fighting. Let me tell you straight up, 
my cousin Nash always had this hero complex. When he announced he was volunteering to help out in the aftermath of Hurricane Maisie down in Louisiana, well, we all kinda rolled our eyes, but weren't surprised. Figured he'd get it out of his system with a few weeks of clearing debris and handing out soup, then come back full of feel-good stories. I'm Damien, by the way, and let's just say I'm not the volunteer type. Me, I got stuck in swamp country only because Nash's battered old truck had him calling me for a rescue. See, helping those folks meant going way off the main roads into the bayou country, and that's where his 80s Dodge finally gave up the ghost. The place he conked out was about as far from civilization as you can get a few half-ruined houses overlooking a sluggish river that seemed more mud than water. Nash, bless his optimist heart, figured hitching a ride back to town wouldn't be too hard. I wasn't so sure. Something about the silence was off, too quiet, even for the backwoods. I tried to voice my unease, but Nash, he was all, come on, cuz, live a little. It's an adventure. Adventure, my ass. The sun was dipping below the cypress trees by the time we gave up on flagging down a single car. The shadows were getting long, and let's just say I didn't like the way they seemed to shift and crawl. Figured our best bet was to make camp in one of the abandoned houses until morning. Thing about these old places, they hold on to their secrets. We found a house with half the roof still on, swept out the worst of the debris, and I do gotta say, I was impressed with Nash. Dude might be a starry-eyed do-gooder, but he wasn't helpless. He got a fire going in the battered fireplace, and we broke out the emergency jerky and stale crackers from his truck. See, he grinned a flicker of firelight in his eyes. Not so bad, is it? I just grunted, the feeling that we weren't alone growing heavier by the minute. As darkness fell, the silence closed in. Then came the whispering. At first, I thought it was the wind, or maybe the river, but as I listened closer, it resolved itself into voices, low and rasping, almost like insects chittering, but way too deep for that. They seemed to come from everywhere at once. Nash must have heard it too, because he went real still. His voice, when he spoke, was barely above a whisper. Damien, you hear that? My skin crawled. Yeah, can't tell where it's, wait, look. We both snapped our gazes towards the riverbank. In the moonlight, something was moving just at the edge of the trees. Too big to be a raccoon, too low to the ground to be a deer. And then, the cloud shifted, and it stepped into the open. Okay, stepped ain't the right word. More like, uncoiled. The thing was long, serpentine moving on multiple legs, but all wrong. They were too many, too spindly, like a spider's. Its body was a glistening black chitin, the moonlight reflecting off it in oily patches. Its head. I ain't got the words to describe that. Insectoid, with big, bulbous eyes and pincers that snapped open and shut. I'll just say I never want to see anything like it again as long as I live. The chittering from all around us got louder, more urgent. Nash and I were frozen, staring at what had to be the stuff of nightmares. Just when I thought, okay, this is it, this is how I die, the thing by the river let out an ear-splitting shriek that echoed, then slowly, as if the strength was seeping out of its many limbs. It sank back into the mud, gone. You saw that, right? Nash gasped, his voice hoarse. Tell me I'm not going crazy. 
I wasn't sure of much anymore, except that sleep wasn't happening tonight. We took turns keeping watch, huddled by the guttering fire, weapons, a crowbar and a pocket knife, clutched close. Every whisper, every rustle, had us jumping, seeing those impossible creatures crawling out of the shadows. By the time the first gray light of dawn hit, we were both beyond exhausted. We didn't speak of it, just started packing, an unspoken agreement to get the hell out of Dodge before, well, before whatever lurked in the swamps found us again. The road was even more desolate in the cold light of morning. I was about to give up when a pickup truck, mud splattered and ancient, came rattling around a bend. The old Cajun at the wheel looked us up and down, then grunted something I half understood meant get in. As we rattled towards the main highway, I caught glimpses of movement in the undergrowth. Nash saw it too. We exchanged a glance, and even though his face was pale, there was a new glint in his eyes. I guess we both got a taste of something real out there, something old and dangerous. Maybe he won't be brushing off my warnings next time I tell him a place ain't right. Turns out, getting back to civilization was a relative term. The town the Cajun dropped us off at was barely a blip on the map, a couple gas stations, a diner that might be generous with the term food. The first phone we found was an old rotary thing in a dusty general store. Got in touch with the highway patrol told some garbled version of our story, enough to get them to agree to pick us up. Waiting for the cops was the worst part. Every car that passed made us flinch, the glare of the headlights reminding us of those monstrous, bulbous eyes in the swamp. The diner had coffee, bitter and black, the only thing keeping us upright. Nash couldn't sit still, pacing like a caged animal eyes constantly flicking towards the dark road. We gotta go back, he kept muttering. We can't just leave them. Those things will get someone else next. I wanted to yell at him, to knock some sense into the guy. Hadn't we almost been that someone else the night before? But there was that gleam in his eyes, that stubborn set to his jaw. That hero complex was burning brighter than ever. When the patrol car finally rolled in, there were two officers. We stumbled over each other trying to describe what we'd seen, the beady eyes, the scuttling legs, the chitinous body. They exchanged long looks, not condescending exactly, but definitely humoring the city folk sort of looks. Sounds like y'all were pretty lost out there, one officer finally offered. Swamp can play tricks on the mind. I opened my mouth to protest, but Nash, damn him, cut me off. Look, we saw something. We don't know what, but it's dangerous. Can we at least file a report? There was a long pause, then the officers gave in probably figuring it'd get us to shut up. We filled out an incident report, descriptions that felt pathetically inadequate on paper. The officers assured us they'd look into it, their voices heavy with skepticism. Like we were a couple of drunk uncles rambling about Bigfoot. I was ready to go, figure this whole thing was a wash. Nash, though, he wouldn't budge. We're not leaving until you guys take this seriously, he insisted. Something shifted in the officer's expressions then, a touch of weariness maybe. The older one gave a curt nod. Tell you what, he offered. Tomorrow, we'll take a drive out to where your truck broke down, see if there's anything to find. Y'all stay put. Stay put easy for him to say. The motel they put us up in was the kind designed for a different type of clientele, if you catch my drift. 
but it had four walls and a roof, and after the night before, that felt like a luxury. Sleep didn't come easy, the image of those chittering horrors forever burned in my mind. Morning came, too bright and cheerful for what lay ahead. The drive out with the officers was tense. The further we got from town, the thicker the swamp seemed to press in on us. The spot where we'd camped looked disturbingly normal in the daylight, almost peaceful. Yet, I could picture the moonlight glinting off that unnatural shell, the chittering voices all around us. I don't see nothing, one of the officers muttered, poking about in the brush. No tracks, no sign of anything unusual. Nash wasn't having it. They're here, he insisted, voice tight. They move at night, they. He was cut off by a yell from the other officer. We all froze. He was pointing into the trees near the riverbank. There, half submerged in the mud, was something that made my stomach turn, a deer carcass, but picked clean in some awful, unnatural way. Its bones were fragmented, like they'd been crushed and sucked out. The officers reacted then, guns drawn, eyes scanning the treeline. But whatever had done that was long gone. The air crackled with tension. Then, the older officer gave a sigh and reholstered his weapon. All right, he conceded, voice gruff. We gotta admit, that ain't normal but this ain't something we can handle. I'll radio for fish and wildlife, specialists for this stuff. The rest of that day was a blur. Fish and wildlife did show up, took samples, made more reports. Nobody said the words new species or unknown predator, but the implication hung heavy in the air. Me, I just wanted to get as far away as possible. Nash, the whole crusade had gone out of him, like he'd seen enough to know he was in over his head. The aftermath, well, let's just say it ain't pretty. I made it back home, but the swamps stayed with me. Every rustle in the night sets me on edge. I don't sleep much, not without seeing those eyes. Local news tells me there's been more sightings more disappearances near the bayou. Hunters gone missing, livestock turning up in mangled heaps. Fish and wildlife still ain't got answers. Nash, he's down there still, volunteering with the search parties, hunting for signs of that creature. They call him crazy, even more than they called him a hero in the beginning. Part of me knows they're right. But the other part, the part that remembers that monstrous shape rising from the river, well, that part of me understands the fire behind his eyes. Some things, once you've seen them, you can't unsee. And sometimes, the only way to fight back against the darkness is to stare right into its heart. My name's Briar. And let me just say, if some old timer at the gas station tells you to take the long way round when you're heading into the hollers of West Virginia, just do it. I learned that the hard way. But hey, I was a hot-headed college kid back then, convinced a summer job doing trail restoration in the middle of nowhere would be some kind of Thoreau-esque adventure. First day on the job, Foreman Lyle guy looked like he'd been carved from the same ancient wood as those mountains, tells us about hollow folk. His descriptions had my city boy mind ready to laugh, some Appalachian boogeyman tale, right? But he was dead serious. Said they weren't human, not quite, something older, smarter. Stay on marked trails, he'd warned, and be back at camp before nightfall course, youthful arrogance, and all that. Me and another newbie, Cassie, 
figured we'd impress everyone with some extra hours fixing up a remote section of the trail. Cassie, with her bright pink hair and nose rings, was my total opposite. But hey, misery builds camaraderie or something, and we got along well enough. That afternoon, the work was tough but peaceful. Birdsong, dappled sunlight. Then it hit, a smell like rotting meat on a humid August day. Makes me gag just thinking about it. Cassie scrunched up her face too. What the hell is that, she whispered. I joked, bad idea, about Lyle's hollow folk, mostly to calm my own nerves. That's when we heard it. Not a rustle exactly, but wrong, a shifting of the undergrowth that was too smooth, too silent to be any normal animal. We exchanged a glance, the humor gone from her eyes. Let's get back on the trail, she said, voice trembling just slightly. That's all the motivation I needed. We started moving faster but that godawful smell was getting stronger. The tree cover was thick, making it hard to tell where whatever it was lurking. Suddenly, a blur of motion cut across our path just ahead. It was huge, bigger than any deer, and fast, freakishly fast. The shape of it, for a split second, I swore, in the dim light, it looked almost like a man, but hunched moving on all fours with incredible agility. Lyle's stories. Cassie breathed, her voice panicked. Didn't matter if they were just stories. We bolted. It was a blind run, branches whipping our faces, the thing's awful stench hot on our heels. We tripped, scrambled up, kept going, sheer terror fueling us. At one point, there was a guttural sound, a snarl or a hiss, echoing behind us. That was enough to push us past exhaustion. We burst from the woods onto a dirt track just as the sun was starting to dip behind the mountains. A truck was lumbering towards us, and blessed the universe, the old farmer at the wheel actually stopped when he saw the state we were in. We babbled out some half-crazed story about a wild animal, and he, thankfully, didn't look convinced but did drive us back to camp. Lyle stared at us like we'd grown second heads. When we described what we saw, his frown deepened. Then came the bombshell, two hikers had gone missing on a nearby trail the week before. Never found. You think? I started. Unable to finish the question, Lyle gave a grim nod. The forest ain't what it used to be, he said, his voice low. Some things, they hold on in these hills. There wasn't a chance in hell I was staying another night. Cassie felt the same. Somehow, we convinced Lyle to drive us into town. In the rearview mirror, the mountains faded into purple silhouettes, and I knew they weren't just any mountains anymore. I could feel them watching. It was clear that the missing people likely weren't Lyle's first encounter with whatever stalked those woods. We hitchhiked back to civilization, leaving behind job, gear, everything. Some experiences, you just walk away from. To this day, I don't know exactly what we saw. Man? Beast? Some unholy hybrid? But I know this, there's a wild darkness in those quiet places, something old and hungry that has nothing to do with the human world. Sometimes, when a dog barks in the night, its howl echoing a little too long, I'm right back in that forest, the smell of rot in my nose and that inhuman shape loping just beyond the tree line. The Greyhound station back home was a stark contrast to those silent mountains. For weeks, every shadow had me jumping, every sudden noise triggering a rush of cold sweat. Cassie and I kept in touch, 
both struggling to sleep, to shake the feeling of being watched. Then, a month later, I saw the news bulletin. A hiker's body was found in the same national forest where we'd worked. Half eaten. The report mentioned possible bear attack, but I knew, with a bone-chilling certainty, it was our creature. That primal, rotten stench was forever seared into my memory. Cassie, when I called her, sounded shaky. What do we do, she said, voice trembling, it's out there, Briar. It knows where to find us. The unspoken fear hung between us. This thing wasn't some territorial animal. It seemed intelligent, malevolent. Like it had tasted something it liked, city folk. I spent sleepless nights scouring whatever I could find on Appalachian folklore, old internet forums. There were whispers of similar sightings, vanishing stretching back decades. And everywhere, warnings, they won't come into the light. Stay in the cities. Don't go back. But there was one thread that made my blood run cold. It was a barely legible rant about some kind of pact made deep in the colonial days, when the first settlers pushed into the mountains. Ancient land, ancient deals, and somewhere along the way, the bargain got broken. Cassie was convinced it was all superstitious nonsense. Me? I wasn't so sure anymore. Seemed awful coincidental that right when we city dwellers start treating the woods like some weekend yoga retreat, those old hungers wake up. Then, tragedy struck. Cassie's apartment was broken into. Nothing stolen, but her place was trashed, animalistic, like something had been searching. On the wall, scrawled in what looked like blood, were the words, See you soon. She fled to her parents' place in another state the next day. I couldn't blame her. Who'd stick around for round two? But me, something about running felt like giving up. And something deeper tugged at me, a mix of simmering anger and that gnawing, irrational need to know what the hell I was dealing with. I contacted Lyle. I know, crazy, right? But he was the only one who truly understood. His reply was short, just an address deeper in the mountains. A week later, I quit my job, lied to my family about a mental health retreat, and boarded another damn bus. Lyle's cabin was a survivalist's paradise, kin goods, a generator, and an arsenal that would make some small countries nervous. He didn't blink when I told him my theory, just handed me a shotgun and said, been expecting something like this for a long damn time. We spent the next few days strategizing, studying old maps, muttering about boundary lines and ancient treaties. There was a place, a high ridge the locals called Watcher's Peak, where some kind of confrontation was said to have occurred centuries ago. Our plan, flimsy as it felt, was to make a stand there and force the issue. The hike was brutal. Each rustle brought my heart into my throat. The air felt heavy, charged, like the moments before a lightning storm. At the top, we found it, a crude stone circle, weathered and overgrown. This is it, Lyle said, his voice grim. We waited. One night turned into two. Silence, broken only by the hoot of an owl and the distant mournful howl of a coyote echoing somewhere in the valley far below. Lyle seemed to age ten years overnight, his eyes constantly scanning the surrounding woods. Just when I thought we'd miscalculated, it came. Not from below, but above. My head snapped up to see a horrifying silhouette against the moonlit sky. 
It was massive, with leathery wings that stretched longer than my outstretched arms. The thing circled us once, casting a monstrous shadow across the stones. I'll never forget that piercing screech, pure rage and hunger. That was the moment I knew, this wasn't some local forest boogeyman. This was something far older, far darker. This was the thing nightmares were made of. Lyle raised his rifle, aiming into the darkness, time to settle old debts, he muttered through gritted teeth. Gunshots shattered the night, the flashes briefly illuminating the creature as it swooped down. I caught only a glimpse of wickedly curved claws and burning yellow eyes before it disappeared into the darkness again. More gunshots. A roar of pain that made the entire mountain seem to shudder followed by a sudden eerie silence. Cautiously, we waited for the next attack, but it never came. After what felt like an eternity, Lyle lowered his rifle, a grim satisfaction hardening his weathered face. It's hurt, he stated, but it ain't dead. We didn't speak on the hike down. At Lyle's cabin, as the first streaks of dawn were painting the horizon, I finally found my voice. What now? I asked, my voice hoarse. He shrugged, a heavy weariness etched into his features. We live, he replied. We fight another day, that's all we can do. There was no big, heroic ending. No cleansing the land, no vanquishing of ancient evil. That creature was still out there, maybe weakened, maybe not. Lyle was staying. Somebody's gotta keep watch, was all he said by way of explanation. Me? I left, the bus leaving behind a cloud of dust and a part of me I'd never quite get back. In the rearview mirror, the mountains shrank to menacing silhouettes, forever tainted. The fight, it turns out, wasn't over. It was just beginning. Okay, folks, I never thought I'd be the one typing out some no-sleep story, but believe me, after what went down this weekend, I'm starting to think those Reddit threads aren't as far-fetched as they seem. My name's Ethan, and I usually spend my free time tinkering with my old motorcycle, not fighting off, whatever the hell that thing was. Let me back up. See. My buddy Grace and his family land up in rural Vermont. Like, way out in the boonies, his uncle's cabin is the only place for miles around. Now, Grayson loves the outdoors. Me? I'm a city guy through and through. But he swore this place was perfect for a long weekend, and the idea of chilling with some beers far from civilization eventually sounded tempting. We packed his pickup Friday morning, a couple of cases of beer, and our backpacks. Road trip playlists blaring, we hit the highway, trading stupid jokes like we have since high school. Vermont, here we come. Now, that drive was long, even for someone like me who doesn't mind hours behind the wheel. When we finally hit the dirt road leading to the cabin, well, let's just say road is a generous term. It was more like a pothole-filled nightmare, and I was starting to regret my decision to leave my bike at home. By the time we pulled up, dusk was settling in. The cabin was, as Grayson put it, rustic. Peeling paint, warped porch planks, and one of those antique outhouses, it had country charm if you were into squinting real hard and pretending tetanus shots were readily available. We lugged our stuff inside, and while it was definitely dusty, I admit the place had a weird coziness to it. It smelled of old wood and musty blankets, and the fireplace in the living room was begging to be lit. An hour in and I was already starting to relax. 
Not city life relaxing, but a different kind of peace, the thick, silent kind only the deep woods bring. Grayson, of course, was in his element. He was already scoping out the woods behind the cabin, mumbling about firewood and hiking trails me. I was more interested in the cooler of beer and which ratty armchair looked the least likely to give me splinters. We got a fire going and settled into the ancient furniture, cracking open a couple of cold ones. I couldn't imagine a better feeling than that, just the crackling fire, the pine-scented air, and the easy silence you only get with an old friend. Midnight rolled around, and we decided to call it a night. The cabin had two small bedrooms, so we flipped a coin, Grayson got the bigger one, and I ended up tucked into a surprisingly comfy single bed in the other. I was out like a light, the exhaustion of the drive finally catching up to me. It was the scratching that woke me. At first, I chalked it up to an overactive imagination, a branch against the window or some field mice having a party in the walls. But the sound persisted, scratching and rustling right outside my window. I sat up, and a chill ran down my spine that had nothing to do with the mountain air. That's when I saw it. Crouched at the edge of the moonlight filtering through the trees, a freakishly tall figure. It wasn't human, at least not in the way we understand it. Too long, too lean, its body weirdly angled even from this distance. It was skinless, a pale, almost fleshy pink gleaming in the darkness. And the head, Lord, I couldn't even begin to process that. Too big, the jaw elongated, and those eyes. They were voids, just empty black pits boring into me even from across the small clearing. I froze, unsure if I'd even breathed. It just stared, unblinking, its head tilting ever so slightly as if studying me. My mind scrambled for some logical explanation, some way to rationalize this away. A trick of the light, sleep deprivation. Anything but the reality of that impossible creature outside my window. It moved then, not with the jarring speed you'd expect, but a slow, fluid unfolding of those impossible limbs. With a jolt, I remembered the old bolt on my bedroom door, the kind they have in cheap motel rooms. I scrambled out of bed, fumbling with it, the scratching growing louder, closer. Just as I got the bolt in place, something slammed into the door, hard. The flimsy wood shuddered, and the creature let out a sound I can only describe as a hiss, a choked, guttural thing that sent shivers down my spine. Desperate, I shoved the rickety dresser against the door, the scratching and pounding intensifying with each passing second. That's when I heard Grayson shouting from the other room his voice thick with sleep and confusion. Cursing myself for not waking him sooner, I yelled for him to get the rifle from under his bed. A loud crash echoed from the living room, like heavy furniture being overturned, followed by a shriek that wasn't entirely human. Grayson burst into my room, the rifle shaking slightly in his hands. Ethan, what the hell is that? My heart was pounding in my ears, and I'm pretty sure I didn't even manage a coherent answer. The scratching outside my window had subsided, but the air crackled with a tension that made the hair on my arms stand up. We stood there, backs pressed against the dresser, the thin wood our only barrier against whatever waited in the dark. The cabin filled with an eerie silence punctuated only by the rhythmic thudding of our panicked hearts. From the living room came a soft scuttling sound, like claws on the bare floorboards. It's in here, Grayson whispered, his voice tight. We edged towards the doorway, guns raised, muscles taut with fight-or-flight adrenaline. 
What we saw in the moonlit living room sent a fresh wave of terror through me. The fireplace had been smashed to pieces, stone shards littered the threadbare rug. Furniture lay overturned, stuffing spilling out like ragged wounds. At the center of the destruction, the creature was crouched low, hunched over a dark shape on the floor. A strangled cry escaped Grayson's throat. It took me a moment to realize the crumpled form, soaked in the sickeningly sweet smell of blood, was his dog, Bailey. She'd come on the trip with us, a sweet, goofy golden retriever who wouldn't hurt a fly, let alone whatever abomination we were facing. Rage surged through me, hot and blinding. That thing had killed his dog, destroyed his cabin, and it was still here, stalking us in the shadows. It wouldn't get away with it. We have to go for it, I rasped, the words barely audible over the roaring in my ears. Grayson, face pale but eyes blazing, nodded in grim determination. We crept forward, the floorboards groaning under our weight. The creature, still hunched over Bailey's lifeless body, finally looked up. It seemed almost surprised to see us, its blank, void-like eyes fixing on us in that disconcertingly deliberate way. Then, with a sickening tear of flesh, it bit into Bailey, spraying blood across the floor. That did it. We opened fire. The sound of the rifle in the enclosed space was deafening, the muzzle flare momentarily blinding us. The creature shrieked, its impossibly long body jerking wildly. One bullet found its mark, tearing through its hairless flesh. But it didn't fall. It scrambled to its feet, a grotesque blur, and lunged through the shattered window. Glass exploded, moonlight catching the spray of blood as it vanished into the night. We rushed outside, guns still raised, but it was gone, swallowed by the impenetrable blackness of the woods. Silence followed, broken only by our ragged gasps and the persistent drip-drip from its trail of blood. My legs gave out, and I sank to the ground, rifle clattering beside me. I couldn't comprehend what we had just seen, the sheer impossibility of it all. Grayson knelt beside Bailey's mangled body, tears silently rolling down his cheeks. I put a hand on his shoulder, but no words seemed enough in that moment. We sat there for what felt like hours, the rising sun doing nothing to chase away the chill that had settled deep in our bones. When the police arrived, our story sounded as insane as we feared it would. Animal attack was the closest they could come to rationalizing it, but the look in the officer's eyes said it all. He thought we were either lying or delusional. Of course, with no body and only drops of blood as evidence, the case was closed quickly, the whole incident written off as a freak bear encounter. We didn't argue. Trying to explain would have just made us sound crazier. In the aftermath, things changed. Grayson became withdrawn, jumpy at the slightest sound. The memory of Bailey, of her happy, tail-wagging life cut short, haunted him. I couldn't sleep, the image of that creature burned into my brain. The cozy cabin became a symbol of terror, and Grayson ended up selling the whole property, unable to so much as look at it. We went back to the city, to our routines, but some part of us stayed back in those woods. It felt foolish, explaining away that weekend as a bad dream, a shared hallucination brought on by exhaustion and mountain air. But deep down, I know that wasn't the truth. Sometimes, late at night, I still hear the scratching. I see that creature in the shadows, its black eyes fixed on me. And I wonder, was it all real? Is it still out there, lurking in the places where the wild things rule? 
And what if, someday, we cross paths again? I try to push those thoughts away, to drown them in the hum of city life. But the truth is, no part of me believes we've seen the last of that thing. We got lucky that night, but the deep, gnawing fear at the back of my mind tells me luck doesn't last forever. Let me tell you, a road trip to visit your estranged aunt in backwoods West Virginia? Not my idea of a five-star vacation. But when your mom gives you those big, guilt-tripping eyes, well, you end up packing your hiking boots and heading into the heart of Appalachia. I'm rolling, by the way, city girl through and through. And let's just say the transition from sidewalks to winding dirt roads wasn't exactly seamless. Aunt Sylvie's place was something else. A crumbling farmhouse nestled in a valley so deep it felt like the sun barely reached it. There was no cell signal, no Wi-Fi, just me, an endless forest, and my aunt's collection of taxidermied animals staring at me with their unblinking glass eyes. Great. The weirdness started slow, like a creeping chill. There were the rustling sounds in the woods just after sunset, too heavy to be a squirrel. Sylvie's warnings about staying close to the house, the way she'd bolt the doors at night with a grim expression. And then there was the whispering. I started hearing it at night, low and guttural like the wind was carrying snatches of a conversation I wasn't meant to understand. One morning, I decided to explore a bit, get the lay of the land. Figured if something was going to get me out there, ignorance wasn't exactly the best defense. The woods behind the house were dense, ancient-looking trees blocking out most of the light. I hadn't ventured far when I stumbled on it, a clearing, and in the center, a gnarled old tree. The thing was massive, its branches twisting in grotesque, unnatural shapes. And hanging from those branches. Well, let's just say I'm glad I hadn't eaten breakfast yet. They were like offerings, crudely fashioned charms woven from bone, fur, and feathers. My stomach churned, but morbid curiosity got the best of me. I reached out, my fingers brushing against something smooth and cold. Goosebumps prickled my skin. It was a tooth, long and wickedly curved, the size of my palm. Definitely not from anything I recognized. That's when I heard the growl. I whirled around, heart pounding. At first, I couldn't make out anything in the dense undergrowth just the snapping of twigs and that low, guttural sound getting closer. Then, through the trees, I saw them, eyes, gleaming in the dim light like burning coals. The creature that emerged from the shadows was like nothing I'd ever seen. It was canine, at least in its basic shape, but hunched and oversized, moving with a fluid, unnatural grace. Its fur was patchy and mange-ridden, revealing mottled skin beneath. But the head, the head was pure nightmare fuel. Imagine a wolf's skull stretched and warped, the jaw jutting out at an impossible angle, filled with jagged, blood-stained teeth. Terror slammed into me. This thing wasn't just some oversized feral dog. It was wrong. I turned and bolted, the creature's echoing snarl a death knell behind me. Roots and branches tore at my clothes as I scrambled blindly through the woods. I could hear it gaining, its rancid breath hot on my heels. I burst from the undergrowth, gasping, lungs burning. Sylvie's house was just within sight. Safety, maybe. I sprinted for the steps, scrambling for the door handle, fumbling with the ancient lock. Footsteps pounded behind me. 
I risked a glance back and saw the creature lunge from the tree line, its jaws snapping, impossibly wide. I screamed, flinging the door open and tumbling inside. Sylvie was there, her face etched with a fear I'd never seen before. She slammed the door shut and shoved a heavy dresser in front of it just as the creature impacted the wood with a sickening thud. I could hear it clawing at the door, snarling in rage, its guttural growls seeping through the weathered wood. Sylvie grabbed my arm, her fingers digging into my skin with surprising strength. Rowan, listen to me very carefully, she said, her voice grim. Those things, they serve an old god of these woods. They won't leave until nightfall, and they'll break through eventually. She shoved something cold and metallic into my hand, a revolver. Where she even got that thing, I have no idea. Can you shoot? Sylvie's voice was urgent. I, I think so, I stammered, my fingers fumbling on the unfamiliar weapon. The wood of the door began to splinter under another vicious onslaught. You better think fast. Sylvie shouted over the pounding. We moved to the windows, peering out through gaps in the curtains. That monstrous creature circled the house, its eyes burning with malevolent intelligence. It tested the windows, snarling when its claws rasped uselessly against the glass. We waited, that old farmhouse our flimsy fortress against the encroaching darkness. The scratching, the banging, the guttural growls. It was an assault on the senses, a symphony of primeval terror. Every time the wood splintered a little more, my heart thudded in my throat. If they got through. I didn't allow myself to finish the thought. Sylvie's eyes narrowed. There's one way out, Rowan. An old path, forgotten mostly overgrown. Leads to the ridge. Hard climb, but it's our only shot. She gestured at the creatures relentlessly attacking the house, their growls turning to frustrated howls. I stared at her, then the revolver in my hand. Ridiculous, the city girl against, against whatever those things were. But the cracking wood, the stench of the creatures seeping in, left no other choice. If we stayed, we were dead. All right, I said, my voice surprisingly steady, lead the way. The escape was a blur. Sylvie, surprisingly agile for her age, pushed through the undergrowth, creating a haphazard path. We fought through thorns and dense foliage, the echoing growls at our heels. The trees loomed like silent sentinels, their branches forming a twisted canopy against the fading light. The ridge was in sight when we heard it a blood-curdling howl, impossibly loud, echoing through the valley. The creatures had breached the house. We scrambled the final stretch, half sliding, half falling down the other side. There was no time to look back. We ran. We stumbled into a small town at dawn, haggard and mud-caked. The local constable, after hearing our story, looked at us with a mix of disbelief and pity. A search party later found Sylvie's farmhouse, utterly torn apart. They never found the creatures. Back in the city, Life seemed to resume, almost. Nights were plagued by nightmares, phantom growls mixing with the rumble of traffic. It was hard to shake the feeling of being watched, of unseen eyes burning in the urban shadows. Newspapers called it a bear or feral dog attack, which we couldn't deny. There was no proof, just our shattered nerves and shared trauma. And then there was Sylvie. She never returned. The locals said she was seen heading back into the woods, 
armed with an old hunting rifle and a steely look in her eyes. Parvmi understood. There was unfinished business deep in those mountains. The aftermath is the silence, the gnawing uncertainty. It's the way I sometimes catch a glimpse of movement in a dark alley and my heart leaps into my throat. The Appalachians, for me, hold a beauty forever tainted by unseen horrors. And the knowledge that out there, under the indifferent stars, ancient things might still linger, and the whispering might never truly cease.